today's topic are the aquatic biomes or aquatic life zones as they're known. They're going to be categorized primarily by salinity, depth, and water flow, whether the water's moving or not. On the left side, I've got this organized the way that Paul Anderson organized it. So we've got the freshwater biomes shown on the left. Please notice that the ones that are circled in the red are going to be the ones that are flowing and have a current. So these are your lotic systems. I always think of the O for lotic is flowing. The ones that are not circled on the left are the lentic, the ones that are static. And I've added estuaries in the middle along with salt marshes and mangroves. These are a region where you have some brackish water. And then of course the marine ones are shown on the right and we'll be discussing each of these. Let's take lotic systems first, streams and rivers. These are important because the water is moving. Um, it originates from either runoff or from springs. And there's a lot of mixing, a lot of gas exchange at the interface because of the moving water. Just like you'd have an aquarium where you bubble, that's what's happening here. They are also considered an open system because leaves can fall into it, organisms can fall into it. So there's a lot of nutrient flow into this, a lot of mixing and that makes them um, able to deal with pollution a little bit better than say a system that's not moving. Lakes and ponds, these are your lentic systems. They can be divided into three main regions. I'm not sure all of our Texas lakes have the third region. The first one is going to be the littoral zone. This is going to be where light penetrates. It's the shallow region. This is where your emergent plants exist. What that means is that they can have, they can be rooted in the bottom, but still be coming up above the surface of the earth. So this is a very productive zone. We have a lot of um, photosynthesis going on here. The limnetic zone is closer, the more open water, if you would imagine. Here, light does not necessarily penetrate to the bottom. And because of differences in temperature and density, there's very little mixing of the water in the summer. So you get a decrease in oxygen levels as you increase in depth. The profundal zone is the deep area. Like I said, some lakes will have this. Here you get the really cold water. So this is going to be below the thermocline and little oxygen here. And of course, the very bottom part is the benthic zone. So that's where the sediments are at the very bottom. This is a picture showing you some temperature cycles in a lake. I always imagine these are a little bit deeper lakes and a little bit maybe more temperate than what we have in Texas. Let's start on the left. Please notice in the winter that if the lake freezes on the top, remember that ice is going to float due to water's structure, the polarity. And as a result, it acts as an insulator and the lake itself can actually stay warmer than what the outside temperatures are. And it only gets to around four degrees um, Celsius and that's the most dense as far as water gets. In the spring, when it warms up and the wind blows, pretty soon after that ice melts, the whole lake becomes approximately the same temperature and suddenly now the wind can actually overturn the lake, which is very good because it delivers nutrients to the surface from the bottom. We also have a fall overturn as the lakes are cooling off, you'll have the same type of phenomenon where you can mix things. In the summer, that's where the stratification layers are shown. If you notice that the top layer is warm around 22 degrees, lots of mixing going on, then you've got your thermocline where you rapidly change the temperature, and then that cold profundal region that gets really, really cold. Let's talk wetlands. When you think wetlands, you want to think about part-time submerged and part-time terrestrial. So these have to be shallow, and they kind of come and go as far as how wet they are. Not a good place to build your home. They're known because they have a special hydric soil. What this means is that the soil spaces are going to be filled with water instead of air. So let me show you a picture. This is what soil particles look like. The yellow would represent air that's normally found in soil, but in these, when they're saturated with water, there is no air. So the vegetation has to have special adaptations to absorb oxygen in some other manner than just in the roots. Of course, wetlands have been really impacted 
a lot of people have drained them and built areas on them, used them for agriculture, but they also are very important because they, a lot of endangered species visit them, especially migratory birds, and they also provide water filtration as an ecosystem service for humans. This is a picture of cypress knees. So these are trees that are adapted to live in wetland areas. The knees enable some roots to come up above the water level, and as a result, they can get oxygen exchange there. Here's some more pictures of wetlands. Marine wetlands are known as salt marshes. These are found in more temperate climates, and they usually contain non-woody emergent vegetation. Remember, we're in salt water now. The salt marsh is very productive, and they often exist in what are called estuaries, the bays, that where a river goes into the ocean. They can be nurseries for many marine species. It's a very safe, protected environment for young marine organisms. Estuaries themselves, these are going to be the brackish areas where the river brings fresh water in, mixes with the salt water, and it's going to vary a lot, both in temperature and salinity. Uh, salinity because it's the mix of how much fresh water is coming in versus the tides and then the temperature because how deep is it if it's shallow it's warmer if it's a little bit deeper it's colder we've got the tides changing that depth so it's, it's very productive um, organisms just have to deal with those changes definitely an open system again a very important uh, nursery for young marine organisms very vulnerable to pollution Right along that coastline, lots of fertilizer and sewage runoff, and also vulnerable to sedimentation. I'm going to back up just a second. Here's an important part about estuaries. For fishermen, this is where their commercial organisms like oysters and shrimp, a lot of them start or they're young fish. And so if you don't take care of those estuaries, it's going to hurt your commercial fisheries. Mangroves. Notice these are found in tropical and subtropical areas along the coastline. So they're known because of the dominant type of vegetation, which is the mangrove. It's a tree that's specially adapted to live in salt areas. They have special nodules that allow them to excrete salt. And they root and then protect the coastline, both from wave action and storm surges. So they're very important. Unfortunately, they're often the first thing that's removed in when a hotel or something comes in because they want to have a pretty beach for people to play on, and so they take the mangroves out and truck in sand. Again, please note that they're a huge nursery for marine species. This is showing you why. Here we've got the little bitty fish uh, swimming in between the roots where the big predators can't fit, literally, and so that, that gives them a lot of protection and food and nutrients. Um, this is an interesting area to snorkel. If you ever get the opportunity, you'll, you'll see young sharks and a lot of interesting creatures. The barrier islands. These form offshore from lagoons or estuaries. The sediments brought in by the rivers are deposited and washed and form these islands. They're not permanent. People who build on them need to understand that they're going to change dramatically depending on storms. And that's the main thing. They also then serve as protection from storms. The intertidal zone is going to be that little bit of terrestrial area between the high tide and the low tide. Organisms that live here have to face lots of wave action. So this is a really tough place to live. Organisms have to have some way to hang on, and they also have to be able to withstand desiccation when the tide's out, and huge temperature swings. So it's, it's a neat area. It's fun to see the tidal pools, but it, it's tough to be an organism there. Coral reefs. These would be the most diverse biome for aquatic systems. It's like a rainforest of the ocean. Notice that they require warm, shallow, nutrient-poor waters. Can't have a lot of sewage runoff or fertilizer runoff. It'll damage the reef. 
the algae will take over. The coral itself is actually an animal and it has a symbiotic relationship with the algae and that's how it does the photosynthesis that is so important to its food. Here the, there's a phenomenon called coral bleaching that we're seeing more and more. When the coral are stressed due to increased temperatures and increased acidity, they expel the symbiotic algae. And this unfortunately makes them turn white because the algae gives them the color. But more importantly, they lose their food source and then they, if they don't take them back in at some point, they're going to die pretty quickly. Coral reefs are located kind of between the 30 degrees north and the 30 degrees south. As you know, they are highly endangered right now because of the changes that are happening in our oceans due to global warming. And my advice would be to, if you want, is to explore them now if you want to see a coral reef. The open ocean. This area would be the desert of the aquatic world. Because it's so big and the nutrients are going to be far and few between, there's areas, lots of areas where light doesn't penetrate, not much productivity. But it is a large area and so it actually, the sheer volume of open ocean can generate quite a bit of uh, materials. Three zones, photic zone, aphotic zone, benthic zone. The photic zone usually goes to about a maximum of 200 meters. This is where light allows photosynthesis to occur. The aphotic zone is going to be the deeper water that's going to have less oxygen and no photosynthesis. There are some specialized areas called deep sea vents where productivity does occur without light. These are going to contain specialized bacteria that have developed the process of chemosynthesis where they are using methane and hydrogen sulfide from the vents to actually then perform uh, fixation. So that's what I've got shown on the right hand side with the little red coming up and the gases being released into the water. So this diagram does show the photic zone and the aphotic zone. Please don't bother with the neuritic and the oceanic. It's probably not anything you're going to get. And so that is the end of the oceans and that is your aquatic biome show. Sure.